السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على حبيب المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Imagine brothers and sisters if you lived in the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم Imagine that you entered into Al-Masjid al-Nabawi, into the Prophet's mosque You would have encountered a very special woman Aisha radiallahu anha says, I used to visit this woman daily and sit with her, and she used to recite a line of poetry. It's reported from Abu Hurairah radiallahu an that it went like this: وَيَوْمَ الْوِشَاحِ مِنْ أَعَاجِبِ رَبِّنَا أَلَا إِنَّهُ مِنْ بَلْدَةِ الْكُفْرِ أَنْجَانِ And the day of the scarf was one of the wonders of our Lord. The day of the scarf was one of the wonders of our Lord. It was on that day that he saved me from the shores of disbelief. وَيَوْمَ الْوِشَاحِ مِنْ أَعَاجِبِ رَبِّنَا أَلَا إِنَّهُ مِنْ بَلْدَةِ الْكُفْرِ أَنْجَانِي And she would just repeat it again and again all the time, every time that they would sit or, or spend time with each other. And one day Aisha radiallahu anha had this burning question. She said, you know, I'm just going to ask her. Um, you always reciting this poetry, the same line of poetry. You must have a story. What's your story? And this is what she says. I was an Abyssinian slave girl. As you know, Abyssinia is the area which is now northern Ethiopia. She was a slave girl to one of the Bedouin tribes prior to Islam. I was among this tribe and I had no family, no societal connection to anyone. I didn't even have a friend. She was estranged to the extent that she was living among them, but in fact she was living alone. She said, I used to serve the family of my master, and I used to travel with them wherever they went and wherever they settled. She said, one day the daughter of the master came out, and she was wearing this wishah. She was wearing this scarf. In this case, it was a red leather wishah, a red leather shawl or a scarf that you would wear on your shoulders or something that you could tie on your waist. And traditionally, the Arabs used to put golden coins on it or some jewelry or something valuable onto that scarf. It was a sign of beauty, a sign of distinction, and in many cases, it was a sign of power. And so the daughter of my master used to wear this. This was a particular red shawl and, uh, and that she used to put on her waist or put on her neck. And one day she went to sleep. When she went to sleep, a bird came and thought that it was a piece of meat because of its color, and suddenly snatched it up. The bird picked it up and flew away with it. When she woke, she started to scream, my wishah is missing, my scarf is missing. So she calls out to her father, and the father calls out to the elders of the tribe, and she said, somebody took my scarf. So obviously, what did they do? They all looked at me. And they came, all came to me and they started to interrogate me and say, what happened to her scarf? Did you take it away? Did you sell it? Are you hiding it? Where is it? They just assumed automatically that I was the one to blame. So she said, I told them. I said, a bird came, grabbed it and took it away. And maybe the bird thought it was a piece of meat. And when she said that, he said, my master said to me, couldn't you come up with a better lie than that? I mean, you could have come clean and say that you stole it or you're hiding it somewhere. Or you could have said that you gave it to somebody else. But if you're going to lie, at least come up with a good excuse. At least something that makes sense. At least say, maybe the girl dropped it or forgot it somewhere. Don't make up a lie that doesn't make any sense, that nobody's going to believe. So she said to them, I swear that's exactly what happened. So she said that, as I said that, they started to search me, and they started to hit me, and they did not spare a single part of my body, except that they searched for that wishah. She's standing there, she's feeling helpless, and literally, and in any, every sense of the word, she's crying out for help. While this is happening, suddenly the bird comes and drops the scarf right in between them. When that happens, she said, they all look shocked. And they all looked and saw that wishah. And she said, I screamed out to them and I said, Hadha alladhi tahamtumuni bihi za'amtum ana 
وَأَنَا مِنْهُ بَرِيئًا That this is the one that you accused me of and I was innocent the entire time. And she started to scream at them because it was exactly as she had said. The bird came back and dropped the scarf right between them. And suddenly they realized that they had made a mistake. They felt so guilty for doing that to her that they actually freed her. And now she's suddenly in the middle of the Arabian desert, in the middle of nowhere. She has her freedom. Technically she can go wherever she wants. She, but she's not an Arab. She doesn't belong to any of the tribes. And so she thought about it and she considered that she heard the call of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And she heard that most of the followers in Medina were from the slaves and from the weak and oppressed people. That the message of the Messenger ﷺ was an empowering message for somebody like her. So she made her way to the Prophet ﷺ and she accepted Islam. And when the Prophet ﷺ saw her, he recognized her situation. He realized immediately, externally and internally, what she was going through. This was not like one of the slaves that were becoming Muslim in Mecca, which was the majority of the first converts from Quraysh. This is not a woman who was familiar with the land, she was not like the young homeless men that from a sufa who used to sleep in the back of the masjid. She had nobody. And the only one who realized her situation was the Prophet ﷺ. She was so grateful to even be before the Messenger ﷺ. And she interpreted everything that had happened to her as a means and a way to push her to reach the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That all of the chapters in her life That had preceded that moment That watershed moment Were all meant to lead to that moment And to that reality Aisha radiallahu anha Says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Went and built her a home Inside of the masjid He put a low roof and a tent Inside of the masjid A home inside of a home Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, remarked that he likened it to the building of Zakaria, of the mihrab for Maryam alayhi salam. Except in this case, it wasn't Maryam, the mother of Isa, the daughter of Imran, but rather it was just some random Abyssinian black slave in the middle of Arabia that had this incredible journey. And yet the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allotted a specific portion of the masjid just for her. And she would stay in her quarters. For those who aren't familiar with the story yet, you may know her as Umm Mehjan, who is the woman that used to clean the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What you may not know is that it was never her job to clean the masjid. She wasn't hired to do that. It wasn't part of her job or responsibility. But she took it upon herself. Whenever she noticed something in the masjid, she would pick it up and she would clean it right away. It was prompted by a love for the house of Allah. And this woman had a very special place with the Prophet wasallam because he knew that her story was not ordinary. And that she was extraordinary with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She was one of those hidden gems, as we say, from among the awliya. From among the close friends of Allah that people don't even take a second look at. But are people who are incredibly special. He knew that. So Aisha radiallahu anha felt compelled. Now imagine the feeling of Aisha at that moment. Because if you love the Messenger وسلم, then you love all of those who he loves. And every time Aisha would see her, she would, make, <coughs> she would make time and make sure that she spends time with this woman. And she would hear her again and again recite that poem, وَيَوْمَ الْوِشَاحِ 
من أعاجيب ربنا ألا إنه من بلدة الكفر أنجاني And the day of the scarf was one of the wonders of our Lord. The day of the scarf was one of the wonders of our Lord. Uh, it was on that day that he saved me from the shores of disbelief. That is a window into how she viewed her life experiences. And then one day the Prophet ﷺ comes out. And he notices that she's not present for the entire day. And he feels that something is different. The wording of the hadith is something which is extremely beautiful. What's described in the hadith is فَقَدَ عَلَيْهَا is that the Prophet ﷺ missed her. The Prophet ﷺ noticed her, wondered where she was. He noticed it right away. It's not like days passed by, weeks passed by. It didn't take him a long time before the Prophet ﷺ realized that she was missing. And so he asked his companions, where is that woman? And they told him, she died last night, and she died at a very odd time of the night. And, she, and just before you consider beyond that, imagine that this woman died in Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi, in the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. She was freed by the Prophet ﷺ. Her worldly home was literally built by the hands of the Prophet ﷺ, and that is exactly the place where she died. But the Sahaba thought that it would disturb the Prophet ﷺ, that it wasn't the right time to bother him, to come and to pray the janazah. So instead, they went ahead, they washed her body, and they prayed on her without waking the Prophet ﷺ. When he heard that, he was so angry, and he was so because of many reasons. He said, why did you not inform me? And according to the narrator of the hadith, he said it seemed, in the hadith it appears, it seemed that they considered the matter insignificant. One of the reasons, which is, it's implied that this is what upset the Prophet ﷺ, that how dare they consider that the death of this woman is something insignificant. One of the reasons that the Prophet ﷺ was upset was because he wanted to be the one to pray the janazah over her, to pray onto her, and to make dua for her. Another was that the Sahaba did not understand how valuable she was, and they did not understand her maqam, her position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He then said to them, take me to her grave. When it was shown to him, he offered the janazah, the prayer over it, and said, these graves cover those in them with darkness. All of the people who are in the graveyards, all of them are covered with darkness. And Allah illuminates them for the inmates as a result of my supplication for them. My dua is a light for all of the people that I pray for. This is the only example in all of the seerah, in all of the ahadith that you could ever search for, that we know of, in which a janazah was performed twice. And Najasi, the Prophet ﷺ, he did it in his absence, but that was the only janazah offered on the king from Ethiopia. He saw the value in this woman so much that he went ahead and he prayed the janazah on her again probably with some other sahaba. Although Khairul Qurun, the best of all of the generations, had already prayed a janazah over her, he wanted to do it all over again. And so we ask Allah, may He grant this woman companion a ship of the Prophet ﷺ in Jannah. Some of the story and the details I took from uh, Shaykh Umar Sulaiman uh, was very beneficial because as you know, some of the story appears in the ahadith, the one of Abu Huraira and the one of Aisha, but some of it also appears in the history books. But there's a question, brothers and sisters, in concluding this that we have to ask. If you entered into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, would you be one of the people that notices her? Would you know her story? Would you see her value, her maqam, her standing before Allah? 
Would you even recognize it? Every day we see people who are in need and we devalue them. We think that the person is worth less because that person is wanting of something. Especially those who are close and, and, and those who are far away in distant lands. Right now there are countless people who are risking their lives for us and we barely even see them. I want to mention something that's happening in, in popular culture. Last week, Ellen posted on Twitter. She wrote, being in quarantine is like being in jail. And then there was a mother that posted, my 19-year-old daughter is a fast food worker exposed every day. Mike Sington replied, your daughter is a hero. And she replied right away. She said, no, my daughter is the slave of capitalism. She can't quit because she would be homeless. She, can, she can't come home because she'll, she might infect me or her sister. Let's call it what it is. She's not a hero. She's a sacrifice demanded by the elites. Now, as you know, brothers and sisters, in our deen, in our way of thinking, a person's value, their intrinsic value is connected to their fitrah. It is connected to their primordial state. It is connected to the condition of their soul. It has nothing to do with the appearance of their body. It has nothing to do with their earning capacity. It has nothing to do with their complexion. It has nothing to do with their social position. None of that enters into the equation of that person's worth, which is something which is determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who said, وَلَقَدَ كَرَّمْنَا Bani Adam, we have most surely instilled nobility in the children of Adam. So the Twitter war prompted a very serious discussion as to who is an essential person in our society. I can't answer the question of who is essential, but I can definitely tell you who is not essential. It's definitely not the celebrities. It's not the movie stars and actors. It's not athletes. It's not entertainers. It's not social media influencers. Those people are not essential to our society. It is the people who would love to stay home safely, but instead they show up as a nurse without enough protection. They're the people who stock up the vegetables in the supermarket or the janitor that cleans up the hospital knowing what the risks are. These are people who are virtually invisible in society, relegated to $10 or $12 an hour. No one seems to see them. But in my mind, there is no doubt that if the Messenger وسلم, was with us today, he would see those people. He would understand and he would have empathy for their experiences and what they're going through. In this small community, in this microcosm, in Berlin, Connecticut, part of the Connecticut, part of the United States, part of the world, we're just a small piece of the pie. But at least in this piece, I want to encourage each other that all of us, that we, before we can love each other, we have to first value each other. And in order for us to value each other, we have to see each other. So as the Prophet ﷺ said, those who love each other, right? Lahum manabir min nur. Those are the people that have pulpits of light on the day of judgment and in the afterlife. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He will make us from al mutahabina fillah, those who care and value and love each other for the sake of Allah. We ask Allah that He will give us the companionship of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma inna nas'aluka jiwara habibina wa maulana Muhammad fil jannah. We ask Allah that He will place us in jannah in the al-firdaus. Allahumma adkhilna al-firdaus al-a'la min al-jannah ma'an nabiyyina wa siddiq and may Allah place us in the best of all company. Barakallahu li wa barakallahu fikum.